We just got a new report from the Census Bureau which says that despite credit card debt hitting a record high, despite loan delinquencies rising, Americans are spending money like crazy and it is growing the economy. What it said is that in October, not only were retail sales strong, but they were higher than expected. And then it said that in September, our retail sales number were just revised upwards. So we had more sales, more transactions, more purchases in September than expected, which means that Americans are still spending money. Now you would think this is good news for the stock market, but this week we actually saw the stock market fall. After the election, after Trump won, we saw the stock market break new record highs. This week, the stock market took a breather and the Dow Jones fell by more than 300 points yesterday. And many people are confused as to why, but one reason might be because of the Federal Reserve Bank. Earlier this week, Jerome Powell said that the Fed is not in a hurry to cut interest rates. What he said exactly is, quote, the economy is not sending any signals that we need to be in a hurry to lower rates. The strength we are currently seeing in the economy gives us, the Fed, the ability to approach our decisions carefully. So I want to break this all down. What's going on in the economy? What's going on with the Fed? And how does this affect the stock market? That way you can be a smarter investor because of course we have a new president and a new president comes with new economic policies and new economic policies can impact different parts of the economy differently. Well, what do I mean by that? Our economy runs on spending and spending is what makes up our GDP. GDP is how we measure our economy. In 2024, our GDP is expected to be $29 trillion. Well, the largest spender of our economy, the largest piece of our GDP is not businesses, it's not consumers, it's actually the United States government. The United States government spending makes up between 22 to 29% of GDP spending, depending on which report that you read. That means the person who's in the White House can impact which companies, which industries, and which stocks benefit through that government spending, through those government regulations or deregulations. Now, what does this mean for you as an investor? Well, if you're a long-term investor who's investing in the S&P 500, it means nothing. Just keep doing what you're doing and you let the markets do their thing because you're not investing for election cycles. But for those of you, let's call them a little bit more involved, a little bit more fundamental, a little bit more sophisticated investors who want to be more involved with their investments, this is where if you understand now how these government shifts affect certain companies and industries, you might be able to find a unique investment opportunity. For example, Donald Trump has talked about how he wants to invest in the military, how he wants to deregulate oil and gas, how he wants to deregulate financial services, how he wants to invest in space, and how he wants to deport many illegal immigrants, which benefits private prisons. All of these things can create an investment opportunity for the people that are financially educated and aware of what's happening. That's why on November 19th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm hosting a free and live workshop where I'm going to be going over how you can find unique investment opportunities out of a Trump presidency. What are the policies that he's talked about? And how will this impact certain industries, certain companies, certain stocks? That way you can be a more educated investor. It's a completely free workshop. This is for stock market investors who are already investing and just want to understand how these new policies can shape investment decisions and economic opportunities. If you'd like to join me, I got the link for you to join down in the description below. But if we talk about now what's going on in the economy, we have to understand and pay attention to inflation, particularly producer price inflation, because this week we got a new PPI report. Now, PPI is the business inflation. That's why you want to pay attention to this because if a business is seeing a run-up in their inflationary cost to run a business, you can expect that that cost will eventually be passed down to the consumer. See, most of the inflation numbers that we hear about, the CPI data, has to do with consumer inflation. That's the inflation you feel when you go to buy groceries. That's what people feel. But businesses ultimately are setting those prices based off of what their costs are. So if you see the cost of a business rising, that generally means that the price that a consumer has to pay, that a person has to pay will rise as well. And what we saw earlier this week is that PPI rose. PPI rose by 2.4% year over year in October, which is higher than where we were last month. Something to pay attention to. And this is where now the Federal Reserve Bank is saying, we're seeing these inflation numbers, which are in the Fed's eyes, good. And we're seeing the economy numbers where spending is strong like I talked about in the beginning of this video, the economy is growing still fast according to the data, 
and unemployment is still stable. We have 4.1% unemployment, which historically is still very low. And this is what I've been talking about for a long time, which is if the Federal Reserve Bank has a 2% inflation target, and they keep saying that the economy is so strong, what's the point of cutting interest rates? Because it doesn't really make any sense. And the answer there is the reason why the Fed wants to cut interest rates is to inflate away the value of the national debt that the government has. But if we keep saying that the reason why the Fed should cut interest rates is to either stimulate the economy, stimulate the job market, or stimulate something, but that thing, the economy, the job market is already strong, what is the point of the Federal Reserve Bank cutting interest rates? And that's where you can start to see where the confusion is. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a dilemma here because Donald Trump says that he wants to see a drastic cutting of interest rates in 2025. He wants to see mortgage rates fall. So we'll see what ends up happening with that because the Federal Reserve Bank and the government are supposed to be two separate entities. So let's see what ends up happening with that. But if we dig deeper into the economy, we also got some new insight into what's going on in the housing market. Redfin, who is one of the largest real estate companies in the country, said that home buyer demand has picked up after the election was over. What it said is that home buyer demand last weekend after the election was up to the highest level that we have seen in a year. And the reason why Redfin says this is it seems like many home buyers were waiting until the election was over to see what was gonna happen. Maybe people thought that they would get some free money. Maybe people thought something would happen to mortgage rates or whatever people thought. People were not looking at homes to buy until the election was over. And now that the election's over, many people started looking at homes again. Now you might be wondering, how did Redfin actually measure this? And what they say, is they count the number of home tours people go on over a weekend. And in the weeks leading up to the election, the number of home tours that people took was very low. People were not looking at houses. And then the weekend after the election was over, we saw the most number of home tours in over a year, maybe because people have less uncertainty as to what might be happening in 2025 now that we have a president elected. But then things get even more interesting. Where we're talking about interest rates, we're talking about mortgage rates, but one of the factors that impacts mortgage rates is the 10-year yield. And the 10-year yield has been rising, despite the Federal Reserve Bank cutting interest rates. Now, let me explain what that means. The 10-year yield is if you were to lend money to the government for 10 years, that's the interest rate that the government would pay you. Now, for all of modern history, Lending money to the government is considered a risk-free return. That's considered the risk-free rate. So when a bank is considering lending money, it is considered an investment for the bank. And when they're considering who they can lend this money to, they're comparing, should we lend this money to you or should we lend this money to the government? And so if the rate of return that the government is paying is rising, then you bet they're gonna charge you a higher mortgage rate. And this week, as the stock market was falling, we saw the 10-year yield rising, which means if you're going out to get a mortgage, chances are you'll probably be hearing that mortgage rates are rising in the coming days. And the reason why is not because the Federal Reserve Bank is raising rates. In fact, the Federal Reserve Bank just cut rates. It's because the 10-year yield has been rising. And so the bank says, you, consumer, person, are a riskier investment than the government. The government is paying out a higher rate of return, so you are gonna to have to pay us a higher rate of return as well to go and get this mortgage. Now, why is the 10-year yield rising? Now, there can be a number of reasons why the 10-year yield rises. It could be because people are worried about the dollar, people are worried about the economy, people are worried about inflation. There could be a lot of reasons why, but what we're seeing is that the 10-year yield has been rising, and along with that, gold prices have been falling, while Bitcoin prices have been booming. Gold had its worst week since 2021, while well, Bitcoin broke a new record high of over $90,000 a coin. This is where, of course, many people are speculating. They're hoping that Trump is gonna make the economy more favorable for Bitcoin, that the SEC is gonna be more favorable to Bitcoin. But this is where now, let's focus this on you. As an investor, if you are a long-term investor, don't get caught up in the emotions, don't get caught up in the greed, don't get caught up in the fear because the reality is the stock market is a hub of emotion. And it can be very easy to get caught up in something that's very exciting, that's one thing that's very fun, something that can get you very riled up to make a lot of money very quickly. When in reality, 
if you want to really win, sometimes you have to do the boring, unattractive things. And that's not always fun because it's boring and it's unattractive. But that's where the real wealth is built. The real wealth is by studying, investing for the long term, and finding those opportunities that not everybody is talking about. Now, sure, if you can hit a great opportunity before everybody knows about it and it pops off, you can make a lot of money very quickly. But that's also not very likely. That's more risky. That's much more gambling. If you are an investor, it's not always that exciting. You just see your money grow and compound slowly year after year after year, and you slowly let that wealth build. Yeah, it's not as exciting, but it's much more proven. It's much less risky. And so if you are a long-term investor, remember, it doesn't matter what's happening in the White House. You just keep investing your money for the long term. And even if you're investing in individual companies, you're getting more specific into which types of funds you want to invest in. Yes, it can be beneficial to understand what the governmental policies are and how those are shifting, but you still want to be investing for the long term and not get caught up in the emotion. Because the last thing you want to do is start chasing. Start chasing stocks, start chasing investments because you hear everybody's making money. That's generally not a good plan of investing. So if we put together this plan of investing, number one, don't invest more than you're willing to lose. That means number one, have some money to invest. Work to pay off your debts, work to have some savings, spend less than what you make and have some money that you can actually invest for the long term. Don't invest more than you're willing to lose. Number two, don't take on debt if you don't know what you're doing. Every stock brokerage wants you to be a trader. Every stock brokerage wants you to take on debt because that's how they make more money. They want you to make more transactions. But we know that historically, it's the long-term investors that are making money. And when you're taking on debt, you're taking on more risk. And if you don't know what you're doing, the debt can then amplify your risk. Number three, know your strategy. Are you investing in ETFs, index funds, and mutual funds for the long term, or are you investing in individual companies? You can do a hybrid of both, but you have to know what your strategy is. Number four, what is your goal? Are you looking to see growth in the stock price, or are you looking for cash flow from dividends? Which one? I personally like dividends. The bulk of my stock market investing portfolio is dividend-paying funds or dividend-paying stocks. Not all of them, but a big chunk of them because I like those dividends. Those dividends pay me every quarter, and I don't have to worry about it. I just keep working to stack the dividends and reinvest the dividends. And then once you understand that, you have to know which asset that you want to buy. That's when you can start realizing and looking into which assets you want to invest in. But you have to go through these strategies. The mistake that so many people make is they read something on Reddit, they read something on Google, they see some random person on YouTube talking about some random stock and they just throw their money into it hoping they're, they're gonna get rich with the money they need to pay their bills next month. And that's how you get screwed over, that's how you get in trouble because now if that thing does not go up, you might be forced to sell at a loss. If that thing does not go up, you will be very stressed. You're playing this emotional gambling game. This is not sports betting. We're talking about investing, which means you have to get your personal finances in order first. Take some money that you're earning. Don't spend it. Live below your means. Pay down the credit card debt. Have the money to invest. Now you put this money to work and you let the markets do their thing for the long term because the reality is markets go up, markets go down. We're going to see recessions. We're going to see market crashes. It's a part of the system. Some people are going to lose their minds. Some people are going to get very rich. And if you want to be one of the person, one of the people that gets very rich, you can't be one of the people that's losing their mind. And that means you can't be investing the money that you are scared to lose. Losing is a part of the process. Everybody loses at some point. But you have to be willing to learn and go through the process. And that means not investing money that you're scared to lose. And then understanding that investing is a long-term game. You don't have to see those returns in the next 30 or 60 or 90 days. We're investing for three, six, nine, ten 10 years. That way your money really has time to grow and compound and build you wealth over the long term. And if you can understand that and you're willing to go through that, then you really see the big returns. And if you say, well, just breathe, you're stupid because you know what? I can double my money in six months because of this. I can double my money in two years. Okay, good. Do that. But eventually what you'll realize is markets go up and markets go down. And the more speculative your asset is, the more risky it is. And nothing wrong to have speculative assets in your portfolio. But when your entire portfolio is a speculative asset and markets go down, because we know that markets do go down, then you could see your entire portfolio fall very quickly. 
This is where understanding your goal. My goal is primarily cash flow. That's why my number one largest investment inside of my business is real estate. 50% of my investments are real estate. That's cash flow producing. 30% of my portfolio is stocks. Half of that is passive, half of that is active. Passive meaning ETFs and other index funds, mutual funds. The other half is active, which is investing in individual companies. But a big chunk of my stocks are paying out dividends. 18% is speculative. That's things like cryptocurrencies and startups. 2% is physical gold. This way, I know what is the speculative part of my portfolio and what is not. And this is where I don't want you to blindly follow what I do. I'm just a random guy on YouTube. I'm not a financial advisor. Markets go up, markets go down. Investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will lose money at some point. But this is where I want you to understand investing is a long-term game. Sometimes markets go up and you'll see people lose their mind over how excited and how much money they're making. Other times markets will go down and people will lose their mind over how fast markets are crashing and they won't understand. I want you to stay calm through the ups and the downs because that's how the real wealth is built. And again, if you want to join me on my free workshop, it's November 19th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link is down in the description. And if you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the markets, you can join Market Briefs. It's a free financial newsletter where every day my team is breaking down what's happening in the markets, and it's completely free. And with that, I'll see you on YouTube on Monday.